Welcome to session two of Dewey Decimal Classification. Um, as I said, let's see, let me go over the agenda for the class in general. Um, last week we talked about Dewey Decimal Classification in general and notes and the concepts of subjects versus disciplines and manuals, the manual to help you out when you're making decisions about numbers and we went over Web Dewey. Today we'll be talking more about subjects versus disciplines and we will get into number building with table one um, and then we'll talk about the rest of the tables next week. Um, but before we do any of that, we're going to go over assignment one. So I will jump out here and go over to the answer sheet and let me make this a little bit bigger. Um, and as we go along, I'll go through and walk through Web Dewey and tell you how I would answer these questions. Um, if you are using an older version of Dewey, yours may be slightly different, but hopefully you can see where mine differ from yours. Um, as we go along, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to, con to jump in. Um, either type some in the question box or let me know in the question box that you would like to be unmuted and I can do that and you can ask a question with your microphone. Okay, so the first one was odds on betting at the horse track. And let me get Dewey up over here. And remember, I think the best way to go about looking at these things is to um, browse and browse the relative index. Um, there are a couple ways you could go about looking for this one. You might want to type in betting and see what comes up for that one. So it's possible, it's under gambling, you might want to see that. Um, you know, and, and as I was go along, I would probably, you know, make notes of the possible answers. Um, check your collection to see where similar items are shells. Um, let's go to horse racing and see what happens there. Um, again, make sure you're in the relative index. One thing that kind of annoys me about Web Dewey is that every time you go back to browse, it resets to Dewey numbers, so make sure to um, check that relative index radio button there. And we'll check at the number for horse racing 798.4. And it turns out that there is a number just for betting on horse racing. And if you click on that, you'll see that there, um, you know, if we knew this was just about the United States and you're using full Dewey, you could get really, really specific. But um, our book doesn't say it's about the United States. So I would go with 798.401 for this one. Did anybody have any questions about that one? Okay, we'll go on to the next one then, um, pre-adult developmental psychology, and it says that it covers um, age groups from birth to 18 and pretty equal treatment of all age groups. So let's go back to Web Dewey. Again, I would browse the relative index, and I would just put in developmental psychology. Again, we're working purely off of titles here. In real world, you would look at titles, you would look at subject headings, you would, you know, browse the table of contents, see what the book is about. You know, obviously you can't always judge what a book is about by the title, but we are kind of working in an artificial situation here. So the number for developmental psychology is 155. And there are a lot of notes about this one, but the actual um, numbers are down here. And remember, we're dealing with children here. We're dealing with um, groups from birth to 18. So I think that psychology of specific ages is a good place to look. I would click on these numbers to get more details. And we see that we have child psychology. which says through age 11, which covers part of our book here. And then we have psychology of young people 12 to 20, which covers the other part because this one goes up to 18. Um, it says they're treated equally. So in this case, you would apply the rule of 
uh, first of two, and you would go with the one that comes first in the schedule. So my answer to this one is 155.4. Any questions about that one? Okay, um, these do get a little bit more difficult as we go along, so those two are pretty straightforward. Uh, next one we have is Current Religions of the Middle East, and it tells us that it discusses Islam, Hinduism, and Judaism. Um, it doesn't specifically say how much of the book is devoted to each. I think, unless it says otherwise, you can generally assume that it is equal treatment, so we will go with that one. So remember, if they're all treated equally, most likely we're going to be applying the rule of three, which means we'll probably want to assign a number that includes all of these, I mean, so we might need to go up the hierarchy to one level of more general numbers. So anyway, we'll start our search. Let's just start with the first religion mentioned. We'll find numbers for all three of them. So we browse the relative index and type in Islam. And that takes us to 297. At this point I would probably just, you know, jot down on a piece of paper or something the number for this one because we're going to look up all three. And so the next one was Hinduism. And we're browsing the relative index. And that number is 294.5. And then the last one is Judaism. So we'll browse for that one as well. And that one is at 296. And so we see that these are all in the 290s, so, and they're all on an equal level of the hierarchy, so if we go up one level in the hierarchy to 290, that includes all of them. So applying the rule of three because there's equal treatment, this book should be classed at 290. I should also mention that one of the um, reasons you know, um, that we went with the rule of three there because there weren't any notes in the um, um, the schedules telling us to do otherwise. It's a, it's a straight up application of the rule of three. Okay, I'm seeing some questions coming in. Um, why isn't it about the Middle East and not religion? And someone else asked, you wouldn't apply the geographic area um, from table two. So we're getting some questions as to whether or not we need to emphasize the aspect of the Middle East. Um, and to that one, I would say, yes, probably in real life you would. Um, since we haven't discussed the tables yet, I wasn't expecting anyone to apply the um, geographic subdivision, but probably, um, and again, it would depend on the you know, actually having the book in hand to really decide whether you would care more about the fact that it's a book about religions or whether you would care more about the fact that it's a book about the Middle East, and it's hard to say from just the title. Um, but yes, probably to actually catalog this book, I would probably put 290 and then add a geographic subdivision to indicate the Middle East, which we will talk about more next week when we talk about Table 2. Um, we're seeing another question come in of alternative numbers. Um, someone asked, why not 291.656? Um, let me look that one up in the schedule. Um, in this most recent edition, 291 is no longer a valid number, so uh, if you have edition 21 or older, 291 may be an option. I don't know exactly what that um, used to um, be used for, so that may have been an option in the past, but apparently that is an unassigned number currently. Uh, we also, oh, it says it's relocated to 200, so numbers that used to be here in 291 are now under 200, which actually segues nicely into the next um, 
question, which is why not 200.9? Oh, and I'm being told that 291 was comparative religion, and it is now um, lumped into religion in 200. Um, and um, the other question is why not 200.9, which is 200 for religion, um, historical, geographic, or person's treatment. Um, I suppose that could be an option. Um, I guess I would say, personally, I would go with 290 rather than 200.9 because we are focusing on three specific religions, not any religion that ever existed in the Middle East. And so I would want to be a little bit more specific and go with the most specific number that includes Islam, Hinduism, and Judaism. So that's the judgment call that I would make. Does that answer everyone's questions? Great. Those are all excellent questions. And then I got a lot of comments when people were sending their assignments in about, well, this all looked a lot easier when we were <laughs> talking about it last week, and then you actually get into applying it, and you see that you make decisions like this. And so, like I said, sometimes classification numbers are really more of an art than a science. The next item is successful second grade readers, and we are told that it contains equal information on whole language approach to reading, oral reading, and evaluating reading skills. Um, again, equal information, so the, each topic of these three contains is treated about equally, so we're thinking we might be in a rule of three situation here, where you go with the um, number that contains all of them, but again, you'll have to check the schedules for notes that tell you to do, may tell you to do differently. So let's look up these three topics. We will start by browsing the relative index for whole language. And this was about second grade, so we will go with primary education. Um, and again, look at these various options. There's one for language arts. This one actually deals with reading, so we want to make sure we're dealing with whole language approach, the correct age group, primary, and the correct um, subject matter, reading. And the number for this one is 372.475. Again, I would write this one down while you look up the other ones. The other topics, um, next one is oral reading. And again, we want to deal with primary education. And so that is 372. 0.452, so it looks like we're on track to class these all under 372, perhaps. And the next one is, let me get this topic, evaluating reading skills. This may be a little bit trickier to find in the relative index. I'm not sure if this is the exact um, language that is used or not, so we may have to try some things. Um, no match in here. Um, let's perhaps try evaluation of reading. And again, this is just kind of a real life example of how you may have to try some different um, searches to kind of get into the schedules. You could try going to reading and just kind of browsing around to see if there's um, anything else. Reading primary education looks like what we were dealing with, and we see that evaluation of reading skills is a number, which makes me wonder why they didn't come up in the relative index, but anyway, the number is 372.48. So we would maybe think that um, 
we have a class list with 372 because that includes all of these numbers. However, remember it is important to look for notes that tell you to do otherwise. Um, so we look at the notes for 372.48 um, and then so all of these actually are in 372.4 so that would be our our thought using the rule of three that we might class them in 372.4. However, there's this note under 372.4 that you might have missed that says unless other instructions are given, class the subjects with two or more subdivisions of 372.4 in the number coming last. So instead of doing one level up in the hierarchy to a number that includes all of them, this one specifically tells you to go with the number that comes last. So in this case, that would be 372.48, the number for evaluation of reading skills. So that is my answer to this one, 372.48. Any questions on that one? I know it's a little bit convoluted. Okay, the next one is testing um, a different rule for deciding between two um, subjects. This title is called The Mathematical Transformation of Map Making. So it's discussing the influence of mathematical theory on current cartographic practices. So you may think you're deciding between classing this with math and classing it with map making. But remember, according to the rule of application, you want to class it with whatever is being acted on. So we're talking about the influence of math on cartographic practices, on map making. So map making is the thing that's being acted on, therefore it is what we class this with. So I would look that one up in the relative index. And again, you may need to try different versions. Um, there is no match for map making, so um, Perhaps cartography is the way to go. And that one does have a number. And it is classed at 526. And we don't have really any information to know if this is more specific than that at all. But I would go ahead and put that at 526. Any questions about that one? Let's see, we have somebody saying they went with 526.8 map projections. Huh, mathematical geography. You know, this is probably hard to make a call on this one without having an actual book in front of us. Um, from the title, I don't necessarily know the difference between map making and map projections. Um, so I think given what we know, I would still stick with 526. Um, we have another question about 526.092. And that is for cartographers. Um, hmm. I guess, again, hard to tell without having an actual book, but given what we know from the title, I would think that this book refers more to the process of cartography and map making rather than the people who do it. So again, judgment call perhaps, and of course take into account where other similar books are in your collection, but I would class this more with the process of cartography rather than the cartographers, the people who do it. Okay, the last one is probably the trickiest one on this assignment. Um, drawing rooms, a comparison of Victorian paintings from England and America. So what I would take away from that is that we're dealing with painting as our subject. And so I would start by browsing for painting in the relative index. And 
So it seems to me that we're dealing with painting as art rather than painting as a building or decorative arts, I suppose, because it does say drawing rooms. Let's see. Hmm. Painting is art, I guess. Yeah, I think that they're painting pictures of drawing rooms, I assume. And we have two kind of options here. We have, you know, the fact that it's about a particular time period, um, the Victorian period. And then we also have the geographic aspect. Um, it's about Britain and North America um, with emphasis on Britain. We're told that it emphasizes Britain a little bit more. And so, and again, sometimes you just have to kind of browse around the schedules, but when you look for painting at 750, you see that 759 is the number for both history and geographic treatment, so both of the options here are covered. Um, and again, here's the decision we have to make between periods of development and geographic treatment. So we're told that its emphasis is more on Britain than North America, so I would maybe start by looking at geographic treatments. Um, you'll see the numbers for North America is 759.1, and then Europe is broken down between 759.2 to 759.8. Again, remember to read your notes. I know it's easy to kind of just gloss over and not think about it, but, and obviously if you're copy cataloging, you won't have to make decisions like this too often, but it's good to know how these numbers are built. And so we're looking at the geographic treatment, and there is a note, the relevant note here was class Western paintings of one or two specific periods in 759.02 to 759.07. So that's telling us that if it doesn't cover a wide range of time periods, if it's basically focusing on one time period, then we should prioritize the time period over the ge geography of it. So... I would go back to the periods of development, and we're looking at the Victorian period, which is roughly the 1800s. So I would class this at 759.05. I know that was probably the most convoluted one we dealt with here. Does anybody have any questions about that one or other numbers that they chose? And we have someone saying they chose 759.0542. And so you would be assuming this, that this painting, our book talks about Impressionist painting. Um, I don't see that we are given that information necessarily. Again, if we had the book in front of us, we might know that. But I would say from what we are looking at here, the most specific we can get is 759.05. If you had the book in front of you and it was about a particular type of painting, like Impressionism, and if you thought it would be of service to your users to put all the books about that type of painting together, then you could go ahead and extend the number. But I think, given what we know, 759.05 is as, as specific as we can get. Are there any other questions about the assignment before we go on to the new content for this week? Okay, well, if you think of any, feel free to send them later on or email me or call me. Um, we'll jump back into our slideshow here. Again, we are talking about session two. Uh, we'll talk more about subjects versus discipline and a little bit of number building. Last week, we talked about how to deal with more than one subject in the same discipline. So, you know, things like first of two, rule of three, uh, fuller treatment, um, rule of application, things like that. Um, now we're going to look at one or more subjects in more than one discipline. So remember we talked about 
subjects versus disciplines and how subjects are particular topics and disciplines are sort of fields of study or ways of looking at a topic and the same topic could be in more than one discipline. I think the example I used last week was that if you had a book about dogs, it could be from sort of a here's how to raise a, p a pet dog um, approach, which would probably be in the discipline of what Dewey calls animal husbandry. Um, but if it was more about the biology of dogs, then that might go in the discipline of biology. So there are a few different things you can do to decide when you have either one subject that could fit into multiple disciplines or multiple subjects in more than one discipline. Um, sometimes you are given an interdisciplinary number. Um, Dewey has built into it these things called interdisciplinary number where basically the decision is made for you. Um, they, you'll see notes that tell you class interdisciplinary works about such and such under this number. Um, if that is not provided, which it isn't always, then you should go with the discipline given fullest treatment. And the other option after that is if you really can't pin this down to one particular discipline, um, you can class it in the main class, the 000 class, Computers, Information, and General Works. Or if none of these work, you can also use basically the same instructions for more than one subject in the same discipline, things like the rule of fuller treatment, the rule of three, the rule of application. Those also apply as well. So first we'll look at interdisciplinary numbers. Um, they are provided in the relative index sometimes. Sometimes they are just noted in the schedules. Like I said, there will be a note that says class interdisciplinary works with this number. Um, do not use if the work does not contain significant material within the discipline of the interdisciplinary number. Um, let me explain that a little bit. Um, how interdisciplinary numbers work is that basically the judgment call is made for you. One or the other disciplines is chosen. It's not a completely new number. It's, you know, it goes with either biology or animal husbandry. So if you had a book that covered both the biology of dogs plus some information about having a pet dog, um, if it only had a little bit about biology and it was mostly about taking care of a pet, you probably wouldn't want to put it in the biology part, even if that was designated the interdisciplinary number. So this will probably make more sense when we look at an example. Um, let's say we have this book called Raising the Bar, Improving Competition Success for Professional Weightlifters Through Weight Training for Fitness. So it has information about weightlifting as a competition as well as weightlifting for fitness. So those are two different ways of approaching the topic, the subject of weightlifting. Now if you were looking at the relative index in the print version of Dewey, um, they would be given with unindented headings in the print versions when there was multiple indented headings. So if you were browsing through the relative index and you looked up weightlifting and you saw the unindented heading for weightlifting had a number and then there were the two aspects, um, physical fitness and then competition in sports, um, this one up here is the interdisciplinary number. It's not indented. And as you can see, like I said, it's a judgment call. They chose between the 796 number and the 613 number and said that any books about both of these go up here at 613. In Web Dewey, um, these qualifications will come after the numbers and so the one that doesn't have a qualification is the interdisciplinary number. So basically, you know, it's the same thing but instead of the systems of indents, they just have anything that has a qualification is a number in one discipline and then the interdisciplinary number is up here. So you'll see um, when interdisciplinary numbers appear in the relative index they are generally also accompanied by notes actual in the schedules. If you click into the schedule and go to that interdisciplinary number you will see a note that says class here interdisciplinary works. And it also redirects you to the other one. So if you only have a book about sports, or weightlifting, bodybuilding as a sport, you would go to 
And so here's that number for 796.41, and it doesn't say anything about um, it. It does tell you that weightlifting for fitness is relocated here. So it will kind of, again, give you the option to jump between the two disciplines and decide which number is best for you. So because this um, subject has an interdisciplinary number, we would go ahead and class this one with the interdisciplinary number because it has more than one discipline. Sometimes when you look up the number in the relative index, it may not be clear which one is the interdisciplinary number, but there may still be a note in the schedule, so be sure to look for that if you're trying to decide between disciplines. Um, here is another book called Striking Style, Costume Jewelry in the Last Century, Make Your Own. Um, it discusses mass production of costume jewelry in the 20th century and shows how to handcraft jewelry in the same style. So two different disciplines here are sort of the historical approach of talking about mass production of costume jewelry and then showing about handcrafting costume jewelry. So it's approaching the subject of top costume jewelry from two different disciplines of mass production and handcrafts. So if you look up, and again, this is one of those things where you may want to, you know, look up a few different phrases in the relative index. You might look under costume jewelry or just jewelry. Um, where you'll probably be most successful would be with jewelry making. And so we have one for costume jewelry and costume jewelry handicrafts. And it doesn't really say which one is an interdisciplinary number, so you'll have to go look in the schedules. I don't know why there's an inconsistency in Dewey that they haven't put all the interdisciplinary numbers in the relative index, but that is the way it is. So if we just looked up to jewelry, we would end up at 391.7, um, and it would say interdisciplinary works on jewelry are here, but jewelry making is at 739.27, and really that's what this book deals with, either commercial mass production making of jewelry or individual handicraft making of jewelry. So as you see here, jewelry making is here, it's under arts and recreation, is a larger um, category here. And we are told with a note here, class here interdisciplinary works on making fine and costume jewelry. So I would say there's a good chance this is going to be where we'll end up because we know we have an interdisciplinary work and we know it's about making costume jewelry. But you'll notice there's a note here about making handcrafted costume jewelry at 745.5942. And if we look at that other number that we saw in the relative index for um, kind of the manufacturer of commercially made costume jewelry, we have 682.1. Handcrafted costume jewelry, again, we're given that number. Um, interdisciplinary works on making jewelry, interdisciplinary works on costume jewelry. And the heading of costume jewelry itself also has some notes. Again, this can be kind of roundabout. Um, I would go with 688.2. Um, let's go back and look at those schedules again here. Um, because this one has the note, interdisciplinary work on making costume jewelry, and that's the most specific. Um, we don't, you know, it could be seen as an interdisciplinary work on costume jewelry or an interdisciplinary work on making jewelry, but really it's about making costume jewelry. So that is why I would go with 688.2. Questions about that one? So if you are not given any interdisciplinary numbers, either in the relative index or in the schedules, then you just go with the discipline given fullest treatment. And this is basically 
just what we were dealing with when we were deciding between two subjects in the same discipline. Just go whichever one has the most pages about it, the, the bigger chunk of the book. So here's an example. Um, we have a book called Fighting for Home Birth. Um, it discusses the Nebraska legal stance in regard to midwifery, only 20 pages, childbirth at home, 25 pages, and the practice of midwifery, um, you know, the medical practice of it, people who are midwives, and that gets 45 pages. That has the most. Um, so if you looked up medical law, which is probably where um, the legal stance recording uh, in regard to midwifery is, that's what I would recommend. I'm going to kind of skip some of the stages of looking things up in the relative index here because I think we all have that process down pretty well. Um, medical law would go in 344.041. It's under the um, discipline of law. Um, birth customs is 392.12. And if you looked at um, looked up midwifery in the relative index, because of this note down here, you would be directed to obstetrics. So those are the three options. 618.2 then is our third option. And because midwifery has the most coverage, 45 pages, I would class it with obstetrics in 618.2. There is always an option to um, class it with the 000 class, the main class. That's kind of for general works. You probably won't see this very often. Um, I would think 99% of the time you should be able to decide that it goes somewhere else in the schedule. But I just wanted to mention that that is also an option. You know, you'll see it probably so rarely that I'm not even going to go through an example of it. And then, like I said, um, if none of these else other things apply, if there's no interdisciplinary number, there's no um, notes telling you where to put interdisciplinary topics, um, if they all have roughly the same treatment, um, then you follow the instructions for more than one subject in the same discipline. So fuller treatment we already kind of discussed, first of two rule, rule of three, rule of zero, and rule of application. All those things we talked about last week, you can also use them to decide between um, subjects in different disciplines. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about just briefly is the table of last resort. Yeah, yeah I just have to say I love that name. It sounds so dramatic, the table of last resort. <laughs> but um, as the name indicates, you really only use this as a last resort, when you have no other way of deciding between two numbers that seem to be applicant, applicable. Um, Dewey instructions, the introduction, tell you to use it with caution, consider the intent of the author. Um, a lot of times when the schedules tell you which number to use, it's based on this table, so you won't necessarily have to worry about applying this table on your own. So I just wanted to mention it, but don't worry about it too much. Um, most of the time, if you need to apply the table of last resort, that number will be built for you in the schedules. Um, but this is kind of the order of, ta of numbers to use. If you're deciding between something that is a kind of thing versus the materials from which a thing is made, you go with a kind of thing. Um, basically, you just go in order of this table. It's a table of preference. Um, let me show you an example of what I mean by sometimes these um, are built into the schedule. For example, if you had a book about embroidered rugs, you would class it with the number for rugs rather than the number of embroidery, because a rug is a kind of thing, and embroidery is a process, which comes later in the table of last resort. And so the notes tell you to do this. There's a table of preference kind of built into the notes here. So again, you shouldn't have to um, use the table of last resort too much, but it's there in Dewey, and it sort of underlies a lot of the um, already built numbers. Any questions about the table of last resort or the rest of the instructions for um, classifying with the DDC part of the introduction?
Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about today is number building, or what you will sometimes hear called subdivisions. Um, you also will hear this referred to as numbers from the tables. The tables are a, sort of an auxiliary part of Dewey that let you build longer numbers than what is just in the schedules. Um, basically, number building is used to further group like with like um, to be more specific in your classification. It helps organize larger, a large number of items within a topic. So if you have you know, a book about dogs and you want to keep the encyclopedias about dogs separate from the general books about dogs, you, know, you could add a subdivision that will allow you to do that. Um, similarly, you can use it to define more facets of an item, like we saw with um, one of the items in our assignment. You can add a subdivision to specify that you're talking about religions of the Middle East rather than just religions in general. Um, like I said, you use the tables to build the numbers. In a bridge, Dewey, four tables are used. In full Dewey, six tables are used. We are just going to talk about the first four. Um, even though your web Dewey has, um, is access to full Dewey, we are just going to talk about the first four for the sake of time. Um, subdivisions are optional. You don't have to add subdivisions. Um, they are obviously large, more useful for larger collections. When you have a lot of books about dogs, it may be more useful to um, pull out the encyclopedias and group them all together. Or, you know, if you have a lot of cookbooks, it may be useful to specify the country whose food is being cooked in each of those cookbooks. Whereas in a smaller collection where you only have five cookbooks, you may not need to use subdivisions. So again, they are recommended for a large number of items within a specific topic, but they're not required to be used. It's a judgment call as to what will serve your patrons best. Um, here are the types of facets defined by subdivisions in the tables. Um, sometimes they will specify the format, um, a dictionary, a serial, a catalog, an encyclopedia, things like that. Um, sometimes they will talk about the approach or the viewpoint of the author. So a history of, I don't know, say knitting rather than just instructions on how to knit, um, philosophy, a criticism of something. It might reflect that a book treats a certain subject from the aspect of a particular group of people, something relating just to women or just to gifted persons or just to children, something like that. A big use of the tables is for location. So if you have a geographical aspect of your item that you want to bring out, you can do that using number building with subdivisions from the tables. A literary form can be specified using the tables, so poetry or drama, for example, and um, different uses of language, so grammar or etymology, things like that. Those can also come from the tables. To get to the tables in Web Dewey, um, when you're on the main search screen, when you first log in, the tables are down here. If you click on tables, When you click on that, you will get a table or a list of all the tables. Like I said, there are six of them, but we are just going to talk about the first four and only table one today. We're going to talk about the other three next week. Table one has a lot of the facets that I was just talking about. Um, table one is known as the standard subdivisions. When you see something in the Dewey schedules that tells you add standard subdivisions, that means numbers from table one. These can be used, applied to basically any number in all of Dewey. Anything could be subdivided by numbers from table one. Um, they have subdivisions for format, like I said, dictionary, serial, catalog, um, the approach or viewpoint of the author, specific groups of people, and specific locations. Um, if you're dealing with a specific location, you actually use Table 1 in conjunction with Table 2, and we'll see that more next week. So here are the standard subdivisions in Table 1. If you have a book and it is an encyclopedia of dogs, I'll keep using that, um, then you will add 03 to whatever number you have for dogs. Um, if you have a book and it's about the history of dogs, <laughs> let's say, um, you would add 09. 
And some of these have further subdivisions under them. Some of them, that number is basically it. For example, with um, 03, if you have a dictionary or encyclopedia, you add a 03 and that's it. But um, there are some that could be subdivided further. Uh, before I go into that more, um, there is a table of preference under table one that tells you the order in which you should choose subdivisions if more than one could apply. Um, you usually can only use one subdivision unless the instructions tell you differently. So let's see, if you, for example, had a book that was, oh, let's see here, um, considered to be a biography, but it was of um, a particular group of people, because biography comes first in the table of preference, you would add 092 to your number. Like I said, some of these can be subdivided. For example, if you click on 02 in the table, you'll see that miscellany, as you might expect, um, refers to a whole range of things. So how do you use the numbers from Table 1? Well, they may be added directly from Table 1 at any time, um, basically to any number. You know, the schedules don't have to say that it's okay. But there are some cases where the schedules forbid it. Um, they say don't use standard subdivisions with this number. Um, or sometimes they just restrict it, say only use standard subdivisions for this particular aspect of this topic. Or sometimes it would be redundant. Sometimes the, the numbers are basically already built for you. You know, if there's already a number that exists for an encyclopedia of dogs, you're not going to add the number again. Let's look at some examples of this. For example, in this case, the use of the standard subdivision um, 0 to 8 is forbidden with square brackets. And if I haven't already explicitly said that, I should say that anytime you see a number in square brackets, that means don't use this. And the use of the subdivision is forbidden with the brackets and with a note um, because it would be redundant. Um, 0 to 8 is the the, the subdivision for techniques and procedures, apparatus, equipment, and material, and that is already um, basically exactly what exists in 522. So that would be absolutely redundant to use that subdivision in that case. Um, in this case, there is a Dewey number at 153.3 that encompasses imagination, imagery, and creativity, all three which are similar but not totally identical concepts. And in this case, it tells you you can use the standard subdivisions from Table 1 if you have a book about all three of these together or for imagination alone. But if you had a book that was just about creativity and a book that was just about imagery, um, you would not be allowed to use the standard subdivisions. Sometimes, like I said, the number is already built into the base number, so pay attention to that. Um, if we're talking about philosophy, the number 103 already stands for dictionaries, encyclopedias, and concordances of philosophy, so don't add 0 .03 to it. 103.03 uh, .03 would be redundant. Any questions about that so far? Because it's going to get even a little bit more complicated here. Okay, so once you've got the basic concept of subdivisions down, um, usually you add them as is from the table. If you had the subdivision 03 for a dictionary, um, and let's say you had the Dewey number 692, which I don't even know what that is, but whatever it is, um, if you had a dictionary about it, your number for that would be 692.03. However, there are some variations. Sometimes they tell you to drop the leading zero, so in that case it would be 692.3 if instructions indicating that were given at 692. Or you sometimes might be told to add an extra zero, um, so it would be 692.003 if instructions were given indicating that. So here's an example of the first one where 
basically it's added just as it is in the table. Let's say we have an encyclopedia of fruit. It explores many varieties of fruits, their agricultural development and history, and where and how they are currently grown. Again, we're kind of skipping the steps of looking it up in the relative index here, but if we arrive at Orchard Fruits and Forestry in 634, this note tells us standard subdivisions are added for orchards, fruits, and forestry together, for orchards alone, or for fruits alone. So we are talking about fruits alone, so it's okay to use the standard subdivisions. So we want to find a subdivision that tells us um, this is an encyclopedia. But first, let's just write down our base number, 634. Then we go to table 1, and we see that 03 is the number to add for dictionaries, encyclopedias, and concordances. So our full number for this one would be 634.03, and that keeps the encyclopedias of fruit classified away from the general books about fruit. So if you think that would be useful to your patrons, go ahead and add that subdivision. The next option is sometimes instructions will be given that tell you to drop the lead zeros um, when you're adding your subdivisions. So let's say we have a yearbook of chemistry. So yearbook indicates to me that this is a serial publication. It comes out every year. Um, I wanted to kind of show you how this looks in the print version because it's a little bit clearer there than it is in WebDewey, but um, I'll show you how it looks in WebDewey as well. Um, if you look up the number for chemistry, it's 540, Chemistry and Allied Sciences, and you'll notice that there's a note telling you the standard subdivisions are 540.1 to 540.9. This is different than what just adding them from the table would result in. If you added them from the table as is, it would be 540.01 to 540.09. So note that the summary tells you if you do anything different with the standard subdivisions. In WebDewey, this looks a little bit different. It's not quite as straightforward. I'm not sure what the reason for this is. Whoops, we went forward here. Um, when you end up at 540 for chemistry and allied sciences, you'll notice that instead of just saying the standard subdivisions are at 540.1 to 540.9. It gives you examples of some of them. Um, 540.1 is philosophy and theory. 540.9 is chemistry, the history of chemistry. Um, education and research are at 540.7. And so you just kind of have to know that, oh yeah, these phrases sound familiar. They are from the standard subdivisions. So again, not the most straightforward thing, but just something to look at. Um, if you've been classifying with Dewey for a while, you will kind of get used to the fact that, you know, point one is philosophy and theory, and point three is dictionaries and encyclopedias. So, you know, these things will start looking familiar to you, and that should be a sign to you that, you know, yes, you can use standard subdivisions with this number, but you use them a little bit differently than um, what you were looking at, that what you would do if you were just adding them straight from the table. So, let's write down our base number. We know it's going to be at 540. Um, we go to the um, table one, and this is a serial publication, so we are going to add 05. Um, again, there's no further subdivisions, so we know that 05 would be what we would add normally, but since the directions tell us otherwise, we are just adding 540.5. We're dropping that zero. Um, you can also have kind of the opposite situation where sometimes you add an extra zero. And again, this will appear in the schedules. Um, again, in the print version, it would probably just appear in the summary at the top, and it would say 0 .001 to 0 .009 is the standard subdivisions. With WebDewey, again, it's a little bit trickier. So um, if we had a book about small firearms, let me go back here for a second. Um, and we wanted to add a subdivision, standard subdivision to it, let's say it was about philosophy of firearms, or it was a dictionary, or something like that, you'll notice that just, again, some of the examples of the standard subdivisions are given. Um, the first two are broken out, and then we get down here to 0 0.003 to 0 0.009 for the rest of the standard subdivisions. So that just points out to you that if we had a serial publication about small firearms, it would be 
0.005 rather than just 0.5. So look for patterns when you're looking at the schedules for Dewey and when it tells you if you can use standard subdivisions. Sometimes you might have a book that could conceivably um, use two standard subdivisions. Um, you might have a periodical that's also an encyclopedia or um, a history book that's also an atlas, things like that. Um, and so remember that table of preference that was under table one. You use that table of preference to figure out which one to use. And usually, like 99% of the time, you only use one standard subdivision unless the schedules say that for a particular number you can add more than one. So let's say we had that serial publication that's also an encyclopedia. Let's see here. Um, and so they're both kind of down at the bottom of the list. Serials are here and dictionaries and encyclopedias are here, so it just barely edges it out. So if you had a serial publication that was also an encyclopedia and you wanted to add a standard subdivision to help your users find a particular type, um, the table of preference would tell you to go with the um, number for encyclopedias, 03. Any questions about Table 1? We've got plenty of time left. Um, if you have questions about last week's assignment or anything we talked about today. Um, speaking of the assignments, um, this week's assignment is posted at the course webpage, which is at that URL there. Um, again, it's a Word document, which you can download and then email to me. It's due by 8 a.m. next week. Um, let's see. Oh, good. We have a question coming in. Um, what if the number already has a decimal on it, like 432.3? Um, if it was specifically a 0.3, I would look closely at it to make sure it wasn't already reflecting the fact that it's a dictionary or encyclopedia, but um, generally any other number, um, you still go ahead and add um, the subdivision on. Let me jump out here. I'll pull up a Word document so we can do some examples. Let's see here. So if we had that 432 and we were sure that it, it wasn't already reflecting the fact that there was an encyclopedia or if there was another feature. Let's say we had, we had this number and then we had a serial publication about whatever this topic is. And so we wanted to add 0, 0,5 from the table. You just go ahead and add it on. You can add numbers either before the decimal point or after the decimal point. Um, or if you just add 432, so it wasn't as specific as the point 0.3, then you add the subdivision after the decimal point. So it doesn't matter what your number is already built out to. If you had 432.45 and then you wanted to reflect the fact that it was a serial, you could still add that 0, 0,5 onto that. So this is how the numbers start to get pretty long. Does that answer your question? Cool. Any other questions? Our next session will be next week from 10 o'clock to roughly 11.30. Um, again, we'll be going over the assignment for the first half hour, so we'll talk about assignment two. Um, then we'll talk about, we'll continue on with Table 1 a little bit. We'll talk some more about that, specifically about the 09 subdivision and how it relates to Table 2. And then we'll talk about Tables 2, 3, and 4. Um, there will be an assignment number 3. We obviously won't have a in-person class session to go through it, but um, I will post answers to the course webpage after the fact. So if anybody has any questions, now is the time to answer them, and if not, um, if you have any questions on your assignment throughout the week, be sure to let me know, and I will see you online next week for our last session. Thanks, everyone.